Hi, I'm Jeff Davis of the Napa Valley Wine Library Association, hosting this visual oral history with Dr. J. Bernard Seps of Storybook Mountain Vineyards. But you don't go by Bernard much, do you? No, Jerry is just fine, thanks. <laughs> now, did I understand you got that because you published a book? And... Well, I published a book and the uh, publisher said that Jerry is just not formal enough. We need something more, uh, more formal. So that's the J. Bernard thing. I like how you refer to yourself as the owner, uh, the tractor driver, winemaker, visionary, and custodian here at the property. So All of the above, plumber also, if I need to be. It's a small operation <laughs> then, isn't it? Yes, small family operation. Yeah. Right. But your, uh, your daughter, uh, Colleen, works with you? She does. She has for a couple of decades now, and uh, she's the successor in chief. <laughs> and uh, we'll get to this a little later, but I want to mention up, up front that your wife, Sigrid, German-born, uh, was instrumental and also in your success. Very much so. Uh, if, if your spouse doesn't want to help you, you're in trouble. Mm. <laughs> so. Well, we'll get to her a little later, but I want to start off with uh, where were you born and where did you grow up? I was uh, born in California, as I say, uh, you know, a long time ago. Before me, there are only Indians here, but... Uh, uh, Born in Los Angeles, actually. Oh, Spent okay. all my life except one year here in California. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and I saw that your grandfather and your father were both in the wine and liquor trade. Did you they were. work with those guys at all during the period of time? Uh, a little bit. Uh, I don't know how much I accumulated in the way of uh, knowledge, but mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of got into the wine when I was a, uh, working in Yosemite in the summertime. Oh. Okay. And the uh, Awani Hotel where I was working uh, as a waiter uh, needed a sommelier. The sommelier quit. I didn't know what that meant, actually, what that involved. But um, I decided that would be a good job because it gave me afternoons off. And I loved to play volleyball on the beach along the river. Mm. Uh, and I could eat off the menu. And when you're 21, that's a great thing. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so I became a sommelier that way. Yeah, I like how uh, sometimes, even today, a sommelier can just become a sommelier without the studying you know, oh, suddenly it, you're just a sommelier it's a little rarer now yeah. there's a little more to it than, just, <laughs> yeah. than that but i saw you is that what you were talking about also um uh, i saw that you were a sommelier during your college years too so maybe right, that not was in, it. in right. berkeley or in, was that, yeah, when i was at berkeley right mm, okay yeah. so you graduated berkeley and then ended up uh, as a professor at stanford well, uh, you know, uh, Stanford needed a little education from UC Berkeley, so uh, that's where I went. <laughs> okay. That's a little bit of a rivalry. <laughs> yeah, right. Bit. Just a little bit. At what point did you meet your wife, Sigrid? I met her uh, when I was teaching in Southern California. After I was at Stanford, I went to one of the California State Universities and taught in Southern California. And, uh, you know, the salary was not great, and I had a part-time job as a real estate agent. So she was on the real estate office, and that's where we met. Yeah. So there was some sort of appreciation and uh, likeness of each other. Huh? I think so. Uh, she's a very attractive young lady at that time. Well, nice. And still an attractive, uh, but not young lady. <laughs> so it was at, good. At what point did you start considering a second career in winemaking, winery owning? Uh, well, actually, I was. Uh, one of the directors for Les Amis de Vent in uh, Southern California. Mm. And I used to come up and visit the valley, as I did when I was a sommelier at the Awani. And the valley is an easy place to fall in love with. Right. And the people up here, and this is, you know, we're talking about the 70s, uh, early 70s, were all so friendly, committed to what they were doing. Uh, it just seemed a great place to be on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, my wife and I have four children. We thought a non-urban agriculture environment would be a great environment to raise kids. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of interest in wine, the valley, and a good place to raise your kids. And fortunately, Sigrid was in support of this idea. Oh, she was indeed. And so I, you two uh, went on a long search for some property. Were you looking for possibly an ex existing winery or just a vineyard at that time? We would do either one, but uh, we didn't have a lot of money, so that was one mm -hmm. of the difficulties. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually put a bid in somewhere else, and we were out bid. Um, but this property, uh, my wife found the ad in the paper, and uh, we came up to the front gate late on a summer afternoon, 
And it was just a chain across there, and this property had been abandoned because of a fire in 64, burned through the air, burned down the old water and everything. And the realtor met us there and, and let us in. And then you come in and there's that oak tree, and on the left then was a meadow. And there were deer playing in the meadow, and that was very romantic. Uh, I like my deer on the plate now instead of in my vineyard, but... Um, then we, went for me. <laughs> <laughs> then we went around another curve, and there's the redwood trees, and three dark entrances leading into the mountain. And there's the caves in which we're sitting right now. Uh, no covering it whatsoever. No covering it at all. Because that is, it the winery had burned down in the 64 yeah. fire. Mm. And there are a dozen redwood groves, the one out right outside the winery and up the hill here. Uh, if that wasn't enough, the moon was coming up over the Palisades. Oh, yeah. And we just kind of fell in love with the place yeah. right there and said, this is what we want to do. It was almost like so, a... So uh, this is, we put a bid in. Uh, we had some hesitation because it was owned by a group of lawyers. Uh, we didn't know what we were getting involved in. Mm -hmm. They turned out to be really nice people. And yeah. uh, they helped us uh, with the financing and so we could do it. They had a great attitude. If you buy some property from a group like that, they said, you are going to work and you're going to make this place better. If we have to take it back, we're going to sell it for more. Mm. So they were, they were quite happy with us. Well, yeah. Somewhat supportive. <laughs> yes, they yeah, were. Yeah. They very much so. So and here we are sitting in those caves that yeah. you discovered. That's right. They were dug by the Chinese back in the 1880s, uh, completed probably in 1888. And you can still see the pick marks back yeah, in here. Yeah. And this was volcanic rock. It is a volcanic rock, right. And uh, I don't suggest that you do what the Chinese did, which was swing their picks above their head. That's yeah, a, yeah. a very tiring activity. Goodness. So, yeah. But uh, a natural place to store your wine. And... It's a beautiful place. And, and I think that's helped make Storybook Mountain because we had this core for our wine. So we didn't have to have the expense of building a, a big building yeah, yeah. outside and all that. You say the, the vineyards were abandoned. Were they? Were you able to bring them back or how much replanting did you have to do? Complete. Oh, okay. uh, there was just no growing vines on the property when we came in 1976. Mm. And uh, in many ways, I think that was a, a good thing to start off with because we could evaluate the land and then go for there. And, mm -hmm. um, that is not always the approach that people take when they come to the Napa Valley, but we said, what will grow best on this land? We looked at the soil, we looked at the climate, we looked at the exposure, we looked at the topography, all those things that go into matching grape and estate. And we decided we would plant the grape that went best for this land. We had the good fortune to be able to talk to a lot of people, a lot of knowledgeable people. I can remember sitting at the uh, table in the kitchen of Joe and Alice Heights and talking about yeah. wineries in the Napa Valley. Uh, I can remember talking to Tom Burgess, um, among the others, Bob Kota was up here at that time. And uh, the last view that we got was from Andrew Chelichev. And he said there's just no better place for Zinfandel than the red clay volcanic soils above Calistoga. So after doing all the evaluation, wow. And Andre giving us his blessing. Yeah, uh, that alone is... <laughs> yeah, right. We decided that Zimbabwe was for us. Wow. So. And you were up to the, the challenge of creating a, a new winery, and partially because you had this credo that went with that scenario. Well, uh, my credo is, why not? Uh, if someone else has done it, why can't I do it? Why not? Mm. Uh, also, I didn't anticipate all the uh, work that was involved, perhaps. <laughs> Maybe that I'll be truthful well, about that. That's the first that. time I've heard that. <laughs> yeah, right. But uh, it wasn't a, uh, a challenge, but it was something we were up to. Um, we you know, moved the whole family up here. Uh, I can remember we had a big garden, supply our vegetables. We bought two cows put in the pasture. Mm. Uh, so we'd have a meat supply. Uh, we told the kids they could not name the cows, so <laughs> didn't want them to be pets. Yeah. Um, so we kind of we virtually lived off the land. We had a big fig tree, which you still have at the bottom here. Sold the figs to a local market to raise a little cash. Nice. Uh, all those kind of hard tech things that mm -hmm. you do when you start out and you don't have a lot of money. So 
but it worked. Yeah. We're here still. Tell us the story about the old winery that was here that ended up leading to the name you chose. Well, uh, this property was founded by two brothers named Grimm, Jacob and Adam Grimm. They came up here and uh, the elder Grimm bought the property in 1883. Uh, he had worked at Tramsburg for uh, quite a while. Mm. Uh, actually, Jacob Tram and Jacob Grimm knew each other in the old country. Used, oh. Jacob Tram used to buy wine from Jacob Grimm actually. Interesting. Uh, and he had a couple of barrels of his wine in the winery when uh, Jacob Schramm came to the U.S. So it's important to know that because Jacob Schramm was the first to bring Zinfandel to the north part of the Napa Valley. Oh. So Jacob Grimm then brought it up here. So Zinfandel has been on this property since the 1880s. It's good to 18th. know. Yeah. yeah. That was one of five varieties. They did some other things too. Of course, a little bit of Riesling being German. Uh, that was here. And eventually even some Cabernet was here after a decade or so. Mm. And naturally with the Brothers Grimm, that kind of led to... Well, <laughs> yeah, right. It used to be called the Grimm Winery, Wine Vaults, and uh, we decided Grimm might not be a good uh, marketing term. So we right. honored them by calling it Storybook Mountain, partially because of the beauty of the place, uh, but in order to kind of harking back to the Grimm's. Yeah, the Grimm tales. And, that's right. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. <laughs> and I love this exquisite carving you have here in this oh, oval barrel that uh, captures a lot of the history. Well, it has that founded by the Brothers Grimm. There's a mm -hmm. nice tale about this oval. Uh, and that is, uh, we had it carved for us in Germany. Uh, Germans at that time were selling their wooden ovals Mm -hmm. and going into stainless steel. So we bought this and, and decided we'd have a car for us in Germany. And my wife did the design. And we did research and we discovered that the Brothers Grimm that came here had a small, came from a small town called Mommenheim in Germany. And so we put the coat of arms of the Brothers Grimm That's on great. the oval. Wow. And when the uh, oval was finished, the employer of the carver liked it so much he put it in a brochure. And he sent that brochure out to other German winemakers that ended up in the hands of the mayor of Mommenheim, hmm. who turned out to be the founder of this vineyard, oh, the founding family of this vineyard, wow. who immediately contacted the employer of the carver and says, what on earth is our coat of arms doing on oval going to the Napa Valley? Right. <laughs> so that's how we got in contact. And apparently they've been in business since the 1600s. That's incredible. In the middle of the 19th century, they had five boys, which was three too many for the vineyard to support. And they came to the U.S., ending up here. Hmm. So that's how we got our start. Wow. And explain uh, the, 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 the grapes, the, the leaf, and the, the fox. Right. Well, we, wanted, we really wanted to borrow something from the other brothers, Grimm, who wrote the fairy tales. But they didn't do very much in, on the way of wine. They came from a different part of Germany. So we had to uh, go elsewhere. We went to Aesop's Fables, The Fox and the Grapes. Mm -hmm. And what we tell people is, if you don't like our wine, it's sour grapes on your part, so not ours. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. That's nice to have. Yeah. And when was that carved? Was that in the so 80s? So that was carved for us in about uh, 78, 79, yeah, maybe right. somewhere in there. Yeah, right. Nice piece to have. So, so uh, you decided uh, to move forward with the idea to become a winery owner, uh, and with Sigrid's support, right. you um, decided to tr train in your tenure as a professor for a, a tractor. Yes, say. I did indeed. I taught for a while. I used to. We used to come up here. Uh, we'd work in the vineyard three days, and I had enough seniority where I could have a three-day teaching schedule. And the other day, that seventh day, we were spent driving back and forth because it was oh. to L.A. Uh, we used to sleep in the back of the pickup. <laughs> uh, we have a, a spring over here. We used to have cold showers. Our real luxury was when our neighbor across the street invited us in for a hot shower in the oh, <laughs> so, oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, so uh, you went back to UC Davis. You went back to school and went to UC Davis and took some courses. And... I, I did take courses at UC Davis, but I think the most important thing was really to work with other winemakers that were here. Yeah, so uh, you did some extensive 
discussions with the winemakers you kind of touched upon earlier? Very, very much so. But I think the crucial one, as far as the winemaking is concerned, is that uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Joe Swan, who was kind of the Zinfandel guru uh, back in the 70s. And uh, when we were ready to have our commercial crop in 79, I wrote Joe a postcard. I said, Joe, I'll come and work for you free, provided we can work one-on-one. -on -one. Hmm. And Joe said, hey, you're, you've got a strong back. I can do that. All right, come on over. So he was in Forestville, and I used to commute to Forestville and used to work for Joe. And uh, I did that for one year, and that gave me the kind of traditional hands-on experience, apprenticeship, if you will, working with a renowned winemaker. Yeah. And it gives you a pattern to go by. You're not necessarily going to follow it. Your grapes are going to be a little different. But it gives you a fallback position, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, well, you learned quite well because uh, immediately you started, uh, well, maybe not immediately, but you started getting, getting well, a name for yourself. It, and... it was immediate, actually. We released our first wine in 1983. Uh, we got a number of first places in competitions. And then... That's at right. the end of that year, there was a competition down on the peninsula at MacArthur Park. Uh, they used to have a Zinfandel competition. And they had well over 100 entries. And we were very excited. You go down and you, you know, pour wine for guests. And then, then they announce at the end of the time uh, who won what. Oh, storybook. Finally got second place. We entered, had entered two wines. And we said, oh, that's great. You know, all this competition, yeah. we got second place. Storybook got first place. Our wines finished one and two. Wow. The first year we released wine. That's so uh, that's a pretty good start. To Certainly. Have. Uh, that kind of gave us a, an entree to restaurants, et cetera. We mm -hmm. can kind of go from there and, and market our product well. I saw that you won more medals as a Zinfandel producer than anyone in your first 10 years. That's right, we did. We used to have a whole table full of them, and I think the uh, mice finally got to us. <laughs> All those ribbons. <laughs> yeah. And then in the 90s, the accolades and the honors uh, continued to uh, to grow, and um, let me run, a few, run through a few of them. Uh, your wine was served to the Nobel Prize laureates in Stockholm. Uh, your wines have been repeatedly declared by wine enthusiasts, Wine Spirits Magazine, and the Connoisseur's Guide as some of the best Zinfandel of the year, as you've indicated. Uh, your wine has graced the tables of Presidents Clinton, Bush, and Obama. And speaking of Wine and Spirits Magazine, Storybook Mountain was selected as one of the top 100 wineries in the world. And... We received that honor now 17 times. 17 uh, times since 2003. Right. That's incredible. <laughs> so uh, we feel pretty good about it, given a small family situation, our limited resources, and uh, yeah. we are producing a, a wine that it gives people a sense of place and has that high quality, and I think that's what Wine and Spirits has liked about our wine. And are they the ones that uh, anointed you Art Artisan of the Year in 2003? Or was that another magazine? Oh, that was another magazine. Uh, <laughs> One of the others that <laughs> yeah, right. loved his <laughs> yeah, Zinfandel. Right. Yeah, we've been called, I've been called the best Zinfandel producer in the world, um, in print by a, another author. And even Robert Parker said that. Uh, one of the top, one of the top five. Rob, Robert Parker was being more diplomatic about it, spreading, spreading the kudos. <laughs> well, he's yeah. a well-respected wine critic, so <laughs> got to go by what he yeah. says. You do make other varietals like Cabernet and Viognier. We but, do. Um, what um, What do you think makes your Zinfandel so special? I think this is a very uh, unusual site. Um, all that investigation we did initially, uh, as an example, we have volcanic red clay loam, and that's a particularly good soil for red grapes. We have an unusually cool site. It's the coolest site in the north part of the Napa Valley. Partially because we face east, so it's just the morning sun and we've got the hills behind us. Mm -hmm. Partially because it's the chalk hill gap right near us. We get that breeze off the ocean and fogs that come in. Yeah. Uh, I think those things are important because we can be as much as 10 degrees cooler than the valley floor along the Silverado Trail on a summer day. Especially and 10 degrees really makes a difference. Calistoga, it gets really warm. Calistoga, there. that side of Calistoga, the east side of Calistoga gets very warm. Mm -hmm. Indeed. 
Hmm. But the valley has kind of a little twist, and, and we're on that twist and up, at, up on the hills. So cooler climate, the right kind of soil, and continue working in the vineyard. Um, it isn't only my work in the vineyard, and you know we, we continue to try to renew, improve the vineyard constantly. Mm. We do. We average over an acre a year. We we renew. It can be better trellis, better watering, better rootstock, better selection, whatever it is. But we also have the good fortune of having the same family work for us for forty years. Yeah, that's so important. For forty years. Yeah, the uh, Ayala family from Michigan. And I think without their aid, we would not do as well. Hmm. So it isn't just me. It's, it's those people that uh, surround me, including my daughter. I will include very definitely, right. so, as well as my wife to start off with. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned Colleen is the one who came back to work with you uh, to me earlier, but you have three other kids that decided right. to go out uh, and do their own they're thing. They're doing their own thing. Yeah. Uh, the wine was not their thing. So, <laughs> But I'm glad Colleen came back. Uh, I think, as I told you, she uh, uh, was going on to law school after graduating college, and the secretary happened to quit. And she said, "Oh, Dad, I'll work for you, and you know, make a little money over the summer." And she never left. She's still here. So that's great. Yeah, <laughs> that's a real honor for your father. Sure. <laughs> for our father. And you know. mentioned that of the th four children, she would would have been the one that you would least expect to do that. I didn't. I didn't expect her to. No, oh. come back. But that's uh, wonderful. You know. She did, and boy, am I happy about that. Yeah, I imagine. <laughs> it's a good thing. You're, what, like three, four miles north of Calistoga here? We are exactly four miles north of Calistoga. Right? Is it challenging for you to get people up this far? Or uh, down that far from Alexander Valley? <laughs> it has been a little bit, but we're not in that main area. But yeah. that turns out to be, in the long run, an asset, because we're kind of off the beaten track. And many more experienced wine drinkers were looking for wineries that are not right on that main thoroughfare, somebody that is off the beaten track. Mm -hmm. So that's an advantage. Plus the fact um, our tours are probably a little bit different. We try to take people out in the vineyard, really have them learn something. Our motto is to have people acquire some knowledge while they're up here, ask all the questions they can ask, and leave with a good impression of the winery. If they buy wine, that's good too. But, <laughs> sure. but the other things are more important for us because we think those are the long-term things that will really help Storybook Mountain. Do you see yourself converting non-Zinfandel believers into uh, yes. appreciating what you're doing? Yes, and, and the great... uh, it, it occurs, it must be at least once a week, just, oh, I didn't like Zinfandel. This is good, though. <laughs> That's going to make you feel good. It, it does. It does. It is a little bit different. Our style is not the heavily extracted, somewhat sweet style of Zinfandel that you find elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it is more of a, a classic wine in the sense of a European pattern of a classic wine. Oh, great. Well, I think my videographer, Justin, might like it because he doesn't like those big Zins either. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, it does have a certain fairy tale, fairy tale feel about it because you have the willow trees here in addition to the red woods and then the, the, the vineyards on the hillside and like you say where you're tasting spaces on the, on the meadow with the picnic tables that are spread out. So there's yeah. a lot of space out there. I think that particular image that you're conveying, a storybook feeling, I still have that feeling. I have to admit every time I come through that gate and come up here, where every time I sit at breakfast in our house, it's kind of above the vineyard, looking mm -hmm. down towards the Palisades. Mm -hmm. I enjoy that view. I feel that I'm really privileged. And when I had to isolate for COVID, I said, I must be one of the luckiest people in the world. If you have to isolate, what a place to isolate in. Yeah, it's yeah. just beautiful. And, uh, you know, I'm up meeting my crew at 7 o'clock in the morning. I work until 9 o'clock at night on, you know, turn off the last of the irrigation for the meeting. Mm. Uh, and I work six days, sometimes seven days Looks a like week. it's keeping you young. Ah, uh, well, I say uh, the hard work and the Zinfandel does it. <laughs> the other thing is that I'm still sulfuring the vineyard and the uh, yeah. kids kid me and said, it's all that sulfur dust you've accumulated, you're mm. preserved. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, real quickly, let's touch upon this uh, winery you have here. I mean, it's, it's condensed. You have a two-story 
more modern building that you work out of. And uh, then you have your your tanks out here, your uh, fermentation tanks and such. But it's it's com compact, isn't it? Well, uh, it enable you know it's enough to get the job done, and we try to do everything. We have our own bottling room here also. Yeah, it's incredible. We just don't like to farm anything out. We used to, as an example, buy grapes from different growers, um, and. Um, well, the last time we were buying grapes was down in the southern part of the Napa Valley in Atlas Peak area. And we shared a vineyard with another winemaker. And we did that, and, you know, we put the name of the vineyard on the label and, and mm -hmm. uh, sold it for a while. And all of a sudden I came back because we had the right to come in and kind of inspect the vineyard and all that. And the owner said, oh, you no longer can get grapes from us. <laughs> the other person sharing the vineyard outbid you. It was truly. <laughs> so there went that source and we decided, I don't want to do that anymore. We'll be entirely in a state operation. Yeah. And uh, that's worked. I think it's helped. Well, you might find uh, some, um, at least some happiness in the fact that Turley went on to be a major <laughs> contributor. So at least he didn't lose out to some, someone who uh, didn't do well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Great. Well, um, well, you must have such a sense of accomplishment. You know, you had all these challenges that you were up for taking on and um, but you have overcome those and I do but I, I, I want to stress you know uh, it isn't just me alone you sure. know, as I mentioned it's the family working for us it's my family that works so hard it's the help we got initially um, secret support yeah all, her, all that all that really helps sure I work um, but I work it's it's got its own rewards just the hard work itself so. But you're world renowned. So for for a, a small <laughs> operation, you are doing a, an amazing work. Well, that is nice. I have to admit, uh, uh, when I go to a restaurant, people know me, and that's kind of nice. For right, it's easier to get a reservation that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to call you at some point then uh, yeah. when I'm coming over to Napa Valley. And, and say, hey. Uh, yeah. Well, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. This is about the third time I think we've sat and talked a little bit, and it's it's, a, it's a, always a joy. And you're a wonderful man. And well, it's my pleasure because uh, when I'm here by myself, I'm always thinking what needs to be done. But see, you let me brag about what has been done. Right. Yeah. That's very nice, yeah. and I appreciate. And you're that. like, oh yeah, I did do a good job. I am doing a good job. <laughs> we all are doing a great job. Right. Well, great seeing you again, Jerry. Thanks. Appreciate it. I'm Jeff Davis for the Napa Valley Wine Library Association. Thanks for watching.